There was no one here for public comment. Uh, present today, we have Suzanne Smith, Lauren Levy, um, Cynthia Swopis, and myself, Joanne Levin. Um, and Sarah Bankert is here as a guest. Um, and Kelly Constantine is recording. Um, and Meredith O'Leary, of course. Um, okay, let me look at my agenda. Okay, did everyone have a chance to look at the minutes? I did them a while ago. Any comments about mute. the minutes? Susan, you on mute. Now I'm not. Uh, thanks, thanks, Lauren. Um, I did, and unfortunately, I didn't attach the um, document when I sent it to Kelly. I, I only had uh, two things. Um, in there, I'm trying to find it now. Um, in uh, uh, three, Roman number three, discussion about the mosquito control district. One, two, three, four, about the eighth line, it should be stagnant not stagnant. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I sense a so mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I sent a, a few minor edits along the same line uh, to Kelly um, yesterday. Uh, these were, I, you know, these were just minor. One was pretty close to the stagnant. It was Northampton, it's trapped weekly with two type of traps. Same thing, another edit that I did, and in fact I had it had done on, on, the, on the resolution uh, declaring racism as a public, emer public health emergency is, I, I do not like the expression resolution supporting racism as a public health emergency because I think there's some ambiguity in the statement uh, almost as if we were indeed supporting racism, as opposed to, mm. no, we think racism is a public health emergency. So I try to stay away from that language, which I try to, to which I passed along in the, in the minutes as well. I think that so would be there... minor. So where is there something that, um, that you would change? Say again. Where is there something in there that you would change? Is there a particular well, line? Instances, for example, Steve Jones thanked the board um, in their support of racism as a public health emergency. Uh, I, I changed see. that to Steve Jones thanks the board for proposing to declare racism a public health emergency. That's one. And then there's a, the second instance is the header Resolution supporting racism as a public health emergency. I changed that to resolution declaring racism a public health emergency. I don't see where you are looking. Oh, it's my, uh, what I'm looking at is the edited version that I sent to Kelly yesterday, which you may have not seen. Okay. All right. Um, I will look at the final version if we want to vote on uh, amendments, sort of. Um, Approving the amendments um, once I look at them. Can, um, I, can, I bring up, can I bring up one more, Joanne? Sure. Under, under the motion for the resolution for, about racism. Yes, I wanted everyone to look at that. Yes, good. Um, added were the specific changes that were made. I don't recall us ever including specific changes in the minutes for any documents that we've reviewed. And um, along with the, I mean, that would make it extremely cumbersome going forward if that were to be our practice. Uh, and without the original document, those changes alone in the minutes don't really make any sense because there's, there's no link to what the original document was. So I, 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 somebody, I think, proposed to put them in. I'd be happy to listen to the reasoning for that, but I don't ever remember us doing anything like this before. Actually, I was the one who proposed we put them in 
because otherwise we have no record of what the changes were. We do have our original document, but unless we write it somewhere, we have no record of what the exact language was. And I asked specifically for Kelly to get it off the tape um, to make sure we got it right so that the new document clearly would have the right language. But the first document was a draft. It has, we didn't vote on it. It, it was just a draft, a working draft. So I, I mean, we have working drafts all the time that, that we work on as group editing and we don't list the changes that were made. We just propose the final document that we vote on. Right, but if, if we don't write it down somewhere, how do we know that the final document is correct? Because we have a written draft and then we have a nothing else written. Well, isn't the final document the only one of record? Um, I mean, Meredith may have some thoughts on this, but something that is proposed to the board to bring forward is has no has ha, we haven't it's just something for discussion. It's not anything we have uh, agreed to um, endorse or move on. Just like the minutes, we don't include the original minutes before we edit it. So I just think that. It's, it's a difficult pres precedent to set, and I think it adds confusion. Um, and I, I don't think the draft has any legal bearing. It's just the document from which we start a discussion. The, the one we vote on is the one for the public record. Right, but... Uh, but I guess I wanted to be sure that what we voted on, we, we got right. Um, does anybody have other thoughts about that? Yes, ask Alan. Alan will know. I, 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 I know that, um, and I'm, I'm not speaking from a public records perspective as much as when we do work as consultants, um, we tend to delete drafts so that later on when there's litigation and discovery, uh, drafts are not to be uncovered so that there's no discussion about what may, what was decided from the draft to the final. So in general, I would say, based on that experience, I would say, don't discuss what, what happened between a draft and the final. Having said all of this, this is the perspective of a private company. And I don't know whether this applies for maintenance of public record. And that's why I'm suggesting we talk to Alan. Mm -hmm. I, I keep every iteration of everything, every document that comes out of our meetings. Um, like, let's take a to our tobacco policy. Um, we amended that probably a hundred times. <laughs> um, I will have every single version documented just for public record, but we don't necessarily, um, before something is codified, make every amendment part of the record of the minutes. Once something is codified and executed, if there was to be changes in the language, that's when it needs to be included in the record of the minutes. Does that I guess I think of I think of our minutes as a document that helps us remember what happened and maybe less um, less importantly as a as a as a public document. I mean certainly it is that. Um, but I, I guess I worry that we didn't have it written any other place to help us make sure that we got the document right. We, we, I'm happy to go either way. I don't believe we did that when we were working on a resolution for the marijuana policy. I think we just had, the, we had a number of meetings in which we discussed it and made iterative changes and the final document that we agreed on after all of that discussion was the one that went into the record, I believe. Now, if Meredith has copies of the previous version, that's okay. That's great. But I, I would, boy, I would really be concerned about what our minutes would look like if we put all of the editing changes for everything we vote on in the, in the minutes. 
So was the uh, draft a public document because it was on our agenda? Mm -hmm. And then, Meredith, did you keep a copy of the red line version that I sent you? Yeah. Sent, because at the end of that the meeting, I essentially went to the Word document, red line what had been discussed and proposed by Susan, and then emailed that to Meredith. Yeah. So I guess it's, it's, it can be done, um, assuming, you know, there's a good file management um, uh, that file exists on a server, it could be retrieved if need be. And then it's a matter is, do we have a public record, a, a easily accessible public record that discussed that? So then maybe we should see, I, I mean, I don't care if it's in the minutes or not, but maybe we should see the final version and make sure that's what we had agreed on, because we haven't seen that. Yeah, I'm wondering where the responsibility lies um, is it to each of us to take those documents and make sure the revisions happened in the draft? Or is that uh, more of an administrative responsibility? I, and I'm, I'm willing to you know, assume that responsibility. I just, I kind of don't know. I don't know, um, just like I don't know, and I don't want to put another wrinkle in this, but I guess I am. I think, Kelly, you send the minutes to all of us. And then maybe to Joanne. I don't know the order. I don't know how that's, you know, so I could do something with the minutes and someone else could do something with the minutes and then, you know, um, I don't know how it should be. Um, so anyway, it's, it might be something that we want to discuss a little bit further. Well, now that I'm able to, um, I think the right thing to do is to send the minutes to one person, which would be me. Um, and then I send them back to Kelly and then Kelly sends them out as I've amended them. And then you guys comment and the comments from the group can go back um, and we all have to approve the changes that the group proposes. I think that's the right process. Um, so Joanne, was it your assumption that I was looking at the minutes in, in your- No, I, did, I saw the minutes, I did the minutes. Okay. I looked at okay. them, but you know, you guys always find, find more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I yeah. catch. Yeah. I just didn't know. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I raised that other issue before that I'm, I'm more of a proponent of let's just put in the minutes what we decide. But there seems to be a culture that wants to put in the back and forth and all, all that. And so I'm, I mean, I'm fine with either way, but it can get pretty cumbersome, certainly for yeah. the minute taker <laughs> to, to do yeah. that. I actually did take out some stuff. I tried to, you know, make it more general, let yeah. some stuff in, but um, I can do even more of that going forward. Just if people leaving want. the discussion as a as a general discussion and not, you know, who said who said what kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to do that. So, how do you want to leave it with the current minutes and the details of our amendment? Joanne, you're on mute. Yeah. What did you just say, Joanne? What would you like to do about the current minutes and the details about our amendments to the um, resolution words that are in there now? Well, I, I think I made my opinion clear. Anybody else? I, I can go either way with it. I mean, I, I, th I think it is important to have a record. I just don't know where that record should sit in, in case we want to go back to it. So. Do we want to uh, defer approving these minutes till next month after Meredith has an opportunity to run this idea by Alan? Meredith, you okay with that? I am, but if you can give me the exact language that you want me to run by Alan, because I'm a little confused <laughs> what it is we're exactly looking for clarification on. So. I think it's a process question rather than specific language. It's whether every edit that is done within the meeting on a, on a document that is proposed and discussed in the meeting, whether all of those changes have to be enumerated within the minutes. I think that's the question on the table, if someone else has. So we had, a, we had a draft document 
And then we voted on a final document, and there were changes. So do we need to vote, or is it okay, or can we put in the minutes those changes between the draft and the final? When you say everything, you're talking about grammar, you're talking about spelling, yeah, right. and content, right? That's what you're asking me to ask him? Yes? Any, any changes that happen between a draft and a final that was voted on? Should we put that in the minutes, or should we not put that in the minutes? Is there a best practice about that? Because we need to remember what it was for our own sakes, but maybe that doesn't need to be in the minutes. Or do you just include the draft and then the revision, the revised draft? <laughs> As opposed to having the minutes document every... Because like Meredith said, with tobacco... <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> that, that can go on forever. Wait, you don't have to. I guess the question is, you know, do you have to or, or is it optional and, and um, or do you just bring the final version to the next meeting so everyone can look at it and say, yes, that's what we said because otherwise it's all verbal. What we yeah. do at the meeting yeah. is all verbal. You're right, you're right. So let's hold off on um, approval of this, these minutes. Does that sound like a reasonable idea? We'll table, table the minutes now until we hear from Alan. Okay, Meredith, you okay with that? Can I, can I just ask one more question? I'm sorry, this is just a clarifying question for me. Um, I, did, I was not at the meeting last time at the end when I believe Suzanne proposed a letter to the editor. And um, when I saw the letter to the editor, I was extremely concerned because it was thanking businesses. And so I put some, a lot of changes in there because I felt that just thanking businesses when we've gone through this, in the community, when the hospital, when everyone has gone through something. So I changed it. And then the minutes came through, and I talked to Kelly about this, and she checked with Meredith. It said that we were, the proposal was to draft a letter thanking the community. So what was the original proposal, just so I know? Was it to thank businesses, or was it to thank the community? My proposal was to thank businesses because of the, uh, I, was, I was impressed that the Survival Center Businesses, including nonprofits, I was impressed that the Survival Center had spent over a million dollars in renovations trying to adhere to our, um, our regulations. And while I appreciate the sacrifices of everyone in the community, it was that extra effort that was required of businesses that I thought should be acknowledged. Um, as it turned out, the letter was broadened and I was fine with that, but that is what I proposed. Okay, I just wanted to, to clarify that so I knew for sure. Um, so thank you. Uh, the minute says thank the community. So I just, you know, want to put I, that I, out there. By the way, I, I thought the, the final letter was terrific. Thank you. Any other comments about that letter? Okay, it did go out in the paper last week ago, Monday, maybe. Um, have you heard any feedback, Meredith? No. I think it, just one more comment. I wanted to take the opportunity as a Board of Health that whenever we take a stand or write a letter or something of that nature, that we give a public health message. Um, and that's why I stuck in wear your mask, Social, you know, you know, I mean, I just think we have to maintain that integrity of, of who we are and what we do. And um, so, that's it. Thank you. Good point. Great. Anything else on that subject? All right. Um, so we'll put those minutes on hold. Um, Sarah, welcome. Hi, everyone. Hi. So 
I'm just admitting someone who's coming to the meeting. Um, welcome. So um, go for it. Do you have a, pre a presentation for us? I do. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen. Great. But I think you'll have to enable that for me. Sarah, could you just introduce yourself and give a little background? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, you're figuring out the screen enable, I'll just say, um, so my name is Sarah Banker and I am the uh, Healthy Hampshire Program Manager and Healthy Hampshire is a program uh, located um, or at least staffed by the Collaborative for Educational Services, which is in Northampton, but is a, a regional serving agency. And um, maybe just to say very briefly, um, back in 2012, um, this initiative came to be, um, Healthy Hampshire came to be through a grant from the state uh, through the Mass in Motion program. And um, essentially it was a collaboration of four municipalities, Northampton, Williamsburg, Belchertown, and Amherst. Um, it began through the health departments, but sort of morphed uh, more into the planning departments as that seemed to be where the locus of the work was situated. And um, a couple of years later, we were originally under the Council of Governments, and then a couple of years later, the uh, fiscal agent shifted to the city of Northampton. And so um, since then, we've been able to use that Mass in Motion grant to leverage many other grants, uh, some of which have uh, went through the city and then contracted with CES to uh, provide the work, and others more recently really through CES itself. And so we are, although we are a mass in motion program, we're also funded by several other grants. And now uh, we have grants covering uh, work in 15 communities, almost all in Hampshire County, but a couple of them are in the Hilltowns. Um, and so sort of Hilltown, uh, Hamden County towns. <clears throat> um, the basic mission of Healthy Hampshire is to increase access to healthy food and physical activity really through community level strategies. Um, so we're, we're looking at policy systems and environmental changes, uh, not education. Um, I have to say that because a lot of people think we ultimately will do yoga classes or something. We don't do any of that. We really work uh, purely in the policy realm. Although um, a lot of us who have been involved over the years have really approached this work in, I would say, a, a community building and a community development approach, um, looking at leadership development, uh, shifting power within the community so that more people impacted by um, the work is, are actually involved in the formulation of it. And so um, that's kind of a long preamble to say um, that last year, um, my department that I am situated in, um, the Department of Healthy Families and Communities is also uh, where the Spiffy Coalition sits um, and several other grants um, sit a lot of substance abuse prevention work. Um, some of you may know Heather Warner um, and there's also a couple of other projects around youth mental health first aid and, um, and other public health related work. And so our department itself um, so this is really broader than Healthy Hampshire, applied to the uh, DPH Community Health Funds uh, grant. So that was almost, that was actually a little less than a year ago. I think the proposal was submitted in December. Um, and I'm here to talk about that because we were awarded funding, which is very exciting. Um, and I did have a conversation, I think, as you all know, with Suzanne, you know, just about that grant and what we are envisioning for it. Um, so I have a little presentation that gets into some of it and I'm happy to have a conversation after the presentation um, to the extent that this group wants about, you know, what your needs and interests are um, specifically um, with regards to this grant. And so we're sort of in a, I would guess, a exploratory and information gathering phase right now. So it's a great time to have those beginning conversations. I'll go ahead and see if I can. Yeah. You should be able to. Yep. I 
Can everyone see my screen? Great. Um, okay. And feel free to just jump in or interrupt me. Um, I won't be able to see hands raised or anything like that because I'm sharing my screen, but just go ahead and speak up if you have a question that comes up during the presentation. Um, so this project we are calling Redesigning Power Structures, at least for right now, that's the descriptive title. Um, as I said, uh, this is funded through the Community Health Funds Project. Um, and the next uh, page actually talks a little bit about that fund if you're not familiar with it. Um, this fund was actually created um, through uh, the Determination of Need program. You can read all about it um, at the website um, and I include the link here and hopefully you'll have that um, in front of you anyway. But essentially, uh, if you're familiar with the DON program, you know, this is a program that uh, requires um, hospitals and healthcare institutions to uh, put aside some funds for the community when they do uh, major renovations and, or other uh, types of changes to their facilities. And because Boston has so many uh, medical facilities, oftentimes um, the DON funds stay in Boston. And so this was really an effort at the state level to be more equitable around spreading those funds out across the state. Because of course, many of us across the state use those Boston facilities, not just people in Boston. Um, so that's my understanding of the DON and how this sort of came to be. Um, there's a couple of uh, uh, sub funds, I'm not sure exactly what they call them, but there's, the, there's a policy systems and environmental change stream, which is what this is funded under. There's also a healthy aging uh, fund. And then there's also a uh, CHIP fund, a community health improvement plan fund. Um, and so I just you know, took from their website, it's really pretty exciting. Um, this fund is committed to disrupting and removing barriers to health. Um, they specifically name structural and institutional racism, poverty, um, addressing deep power imbalances um, through these policy systems and environmental change um, approaches. So we were very excited to see this. Um, there was not a lot of uh, requirements in the proposal in terms of uh, uh, laying out a very clear five-year plan. Um, so we've actually been able to, um, to take our time with this and begin to think really big and vision big with people about what this could look like. And so, as I just mentioned, it is a five year grant, so we have some time to build. Um, so we are talking about the purpose of redesigning power structures and I will say this is sort of coming out of we did a couple of uh, community engagement sessions, we had a dinner at Meteora um, last November, we had many conversations with partners and sort of this is where we came to what we put in the proposal, but certainly could shift. Uh, we consider our process very co-creative, I would say. Um, but essentially what we're really trying to do here is to work collaboratively. We want to address the social determinants of health, health inequities, and structural racism, specifically by intervening at the level of governance. Um, and so we don't, we find that there's not often funding uh, that specifically allows us to think about governance or decision making as an intervention point around health improvement. So we are taking a leap here and uh, you know, going into an area I would say that's somewhat unknown for some of us um, and looking at what it means to actually increase uh, the role that historically and currently underrepresented groups, including youth, uh, play in those decision making processes. And um, specifically, you know, to include them uh, in a way that helps to really impact regional policy, right? And so we will accomplish this by engaging both with people who are from underrepresented groups. Um, and so sometimes I call this sort of a grassroots leadership component, um, as well as engaging partner agencies and municipalities, boards, committees, um, to, to really do the, um, the work around shifting culture, policies and practices to becoming more inclusive um, to the communities that they serve. And so we've kind of got these two ends we're working on um, as part of this grant. I always like to just uh, throw out a couple of assumptions um, that we sort of maybe don't state as much when we're going into as we went into this. Um, we, we do believe we're stronger and healthier as a society when we have full participation in decision making, especially by people most impacted by the issues. 
um, we surface more effective solutions when those people are part of the process. Um, we believe that aspects of our culture fragment and segregate groups, and so we actually need to do the, the work of learning how to work together, that that's part of this work. We don't just, we're not just going to be able to show up in a room and know how to do that. Um, especially when we have uh, differentials in power, or at least the groups we are a part of um, experience that. Um, we, we believe that people most impacted by issues already have a sense of what is wrong and what to do about it. Um, but really, it's about uh, needing resources to move to action. So there's, there's capacity building that, that happens here. Um, but we like to talk, we don't like to talk about it purely in terms of, oh, people just need to build their capacity to become leaders. Actually, people often already know how to be leaders. Maybe they're doing it in their community, but they're, they're not able to break through that ceiling or they're not able to open that door. And what does that look like? for us to be able to do that together. Um, and then, you know, when we allow power to be concentrated in the hands of a few, our collective health suffers. Um, so not just the people in, you know, not just the people who are impacted or oppressed um, or experiencing health inequities, but sort of all of us, um, even those who are, who are not or who are advantaged in a particular situation, our health is suffering in some way too by being in segregation or um, it not, uh, and not living in an, in an inclusive, inclusive society where we all get to um, be a part of those decision making processes. All right, my voice tends to fade by the end of the day after a day of Zoom. So, um, so what will the work be? Um, here's what we're thinking right now. Um, certainly, this is a lot about developing partnerships individuals, groups, and organizations. We're looking for long-term partners um, because we know that shifting culture and practices is, is a long-term project. Um, we plan to um, actually hire a full-time person who would be like an in-house trainer, um, who would offer a lot of trainings, uh, learning opportunities, uh, maybe peer modeling and mentorship. Uh, there could be other methods that I don't know anything about that you know people can bring to the table. Um, really ways of um, helping us learn together about how to do this work better. And looking at like what are the different pathways that individuals, groups, and organizations can follow so that they really understand that they're making progress. I think sometimes it can kind of seem with this type of work, it's like a one step forward, two steps back, a little bit of feeling around in the dark. Um, so what, what are our journeys? What do they look like? Um, and how do we know we're actually making progress? And so we we do want to do some collective work around that as well. And then kind of thinking of this as a, as a learn, act, reflect, repeat. So like um, there's not really gonna be a standard way to get to where we wanna get to. We're going to have to be testing things out and really like um, hearing from people and then uh, adapting in the moment. Um, so that's probably more reflective of my own way of working. I like to I like to take risks and then I like to assess what's going on. And I think that in some ways this work requires a lot of risk taking. So um, that's part of what I'm trying to say there, I guess. This is just like a very brief timeline. Um, we are in a we're just about to begin a hiring process. Um, and so um, that's going to take a bit of time. We are we are looking for um, people to be on the hiring committee. So if that's something that um, someone's interested in, or you, or you know someone who might be um, interested, we're actually trying to. Um, and I can send more emails about this when we get it very clear. But we're trying to balance a hiring committee with at least 50% um, people we would consider from underrepresented groups or um, people who are impacted by health inequities. Um, and then we also need to really work with our partners to understand the best, me best methods of engagement because we are going to be vir essentially in virtual mode, I think, through the spring. Um, so what does that look like to start a new initiative, to have new people together, to try to build relationships all you know, via Zoom um, or other virtual settings? I think that that's something we need to learn more about. Um, we definitely want to identify pilot, uh, pilot, uh, pilot projects to continue to nurture. I mean, I think some of the work that Healthy Hampshire is doing and the Spiffy Coalition is doing already fits in that mode of sort of uh, testing models of leadership development. Um, 
and we want to continue to nurture those. So we want to sort of understand that like many partners are already engaged in this work. You know, how do we continue to learn from real time experiences that many people are having right now? Um, and then, of course, we want to sort of understand, and this is this is part of um, the, the previous bullet point, uh, you know, assess what's already happening. I think we know some of what's happening in the county. We don't know everything. There might be other sectors um, that we don't know about where they're doing some great work in this area. Um, best practices, models, and frameworks. So really um, spending some time between now and December trying to unearth those. Um, and certainly if you have a framework or a best practice or something you already know that's happening, please let me know because that's what we're, we're collecting right now. Um, and then the second part of the year, um, we, we do plan uh, to have a, a partnership convening and something like a strategic planning process while we actually model some aspects of inclusive governance. Um, so that'll be lots of fun. And I'm not really sure what it's going to look like yet, but we're, we're beginning to plan uh, for that and really want that full-time person to be part of that planning process. So that's why we've sort of um, kicked that to the second part of the year. Um, and then we, at the end of that year, we will have a wrap-up assessment and we'll have sort of a, a plan, hopefully, of how we will spend the next four years in this work. Here's some potential impacts that we, um, at least from our vantage point right now, uh, see um, increased representation and decision-making power by youth and adults um, who are most impacted by health inequities, um, you know, serving on municipal and nonprofit governance structures. So I should say, and maybe there's another slide about this, um, but we're really um, looking at those nonprofit boards um, and also, um, uh, municipal boards and committees as you know some of our our primary partners in this um, we hope to see stronger and more health protective social environments with significant improvements in relationships support norms cohesion social capital and community empowerment so really looking at like what does it look like for communities to become more bonded and connected to one another to then act in their collective health or, or exercise their collective muscle around a particular issue, say in their neighborhood or um, whatever. And so we would expect to see and hope to see that, um, that that social environment would be improved for people as part of this. So we're not just looking at individual people, we're also looking at groups um, and even communities as we do this work. Um, certainly, we want to see impacts in the policy system and environmental change realm that better reflect the desires of people with lived experience of that particular health or social condition. Um, we would hope to see shared power models within organizations. Um, and, I, and that's like a very general term because I don't know if most of us know what shared power models really look like. And so that's, I think, part of the learning. Um, and really looking at effectively addressing the root causes of health. Uh, due to a shift in organizational and government or govern, uh, governmental cultures that are more informed and responsive to community need. I thought I had a slide about this. Um, so yep, these are these are some of the uh, the groups um, that we hope to work with. Certainly, many of the partners who have already come to the table who've informed this work um, really fit into these categories. But I think we're sort of open to any level of governance anywhere um, as a potential partner. And this is just my contact information. I, I welcome people reaching out and having conversations um, right now or, you know, questions in the future. Maybe I should I leave this up in case people have questions about the presentation before I stop sharing my screen. Questions? Thank you. That was really interesting. I, I provided everyone with a presentation, Sarah, before the meeting, so they all have a, a copy of it. Thank you. Okay. So maybe I'll stop sharing my screen. We can see each other. Questions? Um, Sarah mentioned that she and I had a conversation about this, and that originated 
from a conversation I had with Ben Wood. I had been thinking about both our discussions about uh, racism as a public health crisis and the fact that we continue to have an opening on the board. And I thought, um, what are some positive steps that we can do in response to our declaration of racism as a public health crisis? Just stating that doesn't seem to be enough. And um, thanks to Ben, he recognized that Sarah and her group had received some resources to address this. And as I understand it, um, there could be some support for not only helping us think through um, what it means for us to practice with the awareness that racism is a public health crisis, but also to diversify the representation on our board. Um, I think the, these, these board vacancies don't arise that often. And I think that this offers us a real opportunity to do what we say we want to do, which is make our activities more inclusive. So it seemed to me that Sarah, Sarah and her willingness and open, openness to talk about this could offer some support in how we approach our overall uh, interest in diversity and how we might um, offer or, or try to recruit is the wrong word, but, but try to, uh, to assure that if we can um, expand the diversity of our board by the open position that we know how to do that and can do it effectively. And um, that was my thinking. So we have this opening on the board that we've had now for quite a while. Um, and uh, Sarah, it sounds, sounds like your group hasn't hired someone yet to sort of lead this effort. Um, and I guess if we were to engage somehow to help with um, working on filling this position, um, how would we interact with your group and when, what would be the time frame for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And actually, uh, since people have come to know about this grant, I've got, I've gotten several similar requests. Um, you know, as you can imagine, uh, you know, everyone is, maybe not everyone, but, you know, hiring processes, board vacancies, it comes up frequently um, in different sectors. And so I am thinking about how we can be sort of more immediately responsive, um, even though we have this longer term, as you know, as I laid out sort of assessment process and convening process and strategic planning process, but, you know, you have a vacancy right now. And so, um, I do, I am part-time on this project. So I will say um, I am happy within my capacity to um, help you think through um, what a next step might be. Um, I won't pretend to be an expert in, you know, uh, inclusive governance structures yet and um, haven't, you know, uh, provided um, uh, support directly to a municipal board before. Um, however, um, my agency has actually been involved in a social justice and equity uh, process for many years, which does involve um, exactly what you're talking about. So uh, how do we create a culture um, that is welcoming and inclusive um, to people of many different identities? Um, how do we get the word out? about jobs um, that are available in, in many numerous ways, um, from how the description is written, you know, to the where it's posted and that kind of thing. And, um, and so there's actually quite a lot of uh, material and uh, things that I have access to that I'd be happy to um, kind of, like if there was a specific question, like I'd be happy to mine the resources that are available to me 
and get you back um, some information that you might that might be helpful for you as you're considering your approach. Um, so certainly kind of on a ad hoc basis, I'm available. And then um, we hope to have this full-time person in place um, by the end of November. And so once that person comes in, um, you know, depending on what kinds of skills and capacities they have, um, they might also be available for uh, sort of direct consultation outside of whatever we're already planning with partners. Other questions or thoughts, Cynthia? Uh, thank you, Sarah. That would be certainly very helpful. And um, maybe we all as a board can um, not wait <laughs> and think some strategies on our own as well. So, but that's that's a great um, a great offer. And I was wondering, um, you know, you you have a a year. You showed us the plans for a year, and the strategic planning process is often, you know, I think we've all been through them. And you talk a lot about um, engaging municipalities, developing partnerships and pathways, and those are the strategic planning. Um, um, that's strategic planning language. But I'm just wondering, from your own perspective, um, what would it look like, pragmatically? What would it look like if we knew we were successful in um, um, realizing the outcomes and the goals of, of this initiative, which is a great initiative? Just as an example, what, what are you dreaming of? <laughs> I mean, I have my own dreams, but certainly, and I can share that, but certainly I think the idea here is also to sort of collectively dream, right? So that's part of the strategic planning process is to be able to so i have my dream it's but it's not necessarily the dream of the project because i want a lot of other dreams in there mm -hmm. um but in in some of the work we've done with healthy hampshire um we have really set our sights pretty high around community um the level of community involvement in our work and certainly we can always do more um but i am beginning to see that there is some, I'm beginning, I guess, to see around the mountain a little bit around it. And I'm beginning to envision, you know, what boards and committees look like when they are fully inclusive. And I think it's, it's about representation, but it's not just about that because we have to understand that how people interact. Um, and I, I, I'm sure you all know this. So I, I don't, I don't mean to sound like I, I have this knowledge, but um, it, it's really about um, the culture and the practice around inclusion um, that's happening at, at, in those spaces. And so that's what matters, I think, uh, more than representation in a lot of ways. Um, and so as we think about, say, diverse, uh, diversifying boards, um, you know, I would say like the first, uh, maybe a, a precursor to that is, what is our current culture? on this board, you know, what's, what's sort of the culture that we have right now <clears throat> and what's the culture that we want? And then um, who, um, and, then, and then begin to talk about um, what does it look like to change that culture? And so we're looking at diversification, not as a way to like bring in a representative of a particular group. Um, while that's super powerful and we wanna see movement on that, like I would love to see I would love to have all the complete demographic information of all the people who are sitting on boards and committees in Northampton that hopefully will happen, you know, this year, like we would get that type of baseline data. And then in five years, we would actually see that it really does tangibly shift mm -hmm. um, to be more representative of people of the general population. So I don't want to downplay representation, but then we also want to hear the people are saying that their engagement in those um, groups feels really good and that they're telling their community this is a place where you can make change and people there's there's a mechanism here and there's a place for you here right um and um that that's a big shift um it means not just that there needs to be a spot but it means that people need to feel like 
their skills and their perspectives are useful and valuable. And certainly this is, this is like, um, this is more even just about increasing civic engagement in general in our culture, right? Like people need to have positive experiences when they step into those, the limelight, right? No matter where you're from. And that's very hard right now because of the kind of takedown culture and things are very politicized. And so um, I think there's, there's, there's across the board just a general interest in enabling civic engagement that really feels good to people. And then to really look at um, uh, bringing in those perspectives and those experiences and really valuing those experiences of people who are, you know, you know impacted by those policies, I think. Um, they, when they're involved from the beginning, and we've done this as we've grown our capacity and funding in Healthy Hampshire, we've been able to do this. So it is about grant money too. You can have lots of good intentions, but you really need a lot of, you need some money to be able to do it and you need time and staff and like all of that. But when we brought people in from the very beginning, it's meant that the program or the thing we're working on is tremendously sustainable. So it's like, and at this huge uh, effort in the beginning, um, it seems like it's going super slowly, uh, inching along. And then, you know, at some point we've had this experience, things take off. And then there's like the sustainability that happens because everyone's just totally bought in and they love it or they, they, they love working together or they, they, um, you know, they it's not just owned by like a program manager at a nonprofit, it's truly community owned. Mm -hmm. And so I see that as part of the vision, you know, of this too, as so many nonprofits are engaged in so much good work, you know, at what point are they engaging with the people who are um, who they're serving, and how do we help them engage with them in deeper and more meaningful ways and earlier? <laughs> you know, because no doubt many of them are engaging with them, but how do we begin to just keep deepening it, bringing people in earlier, and looking at scaffolding as people become more involved? What's the next step they would take after that? Like they go into a focus group, which we love to do in public health. What would people do after that if they had a positive experience in a focus group and they loved being able to share their opinion? Like, is there is there a pathway? There often isn't. When we're when we're collecting data in public health, we're not thinking about that. We're thinking about getting input and then going back and making decisions. Yeah. And so we're talking about okay, so how is there a path for people to be on, and how do we um, really provide that that uh, that path and and open up those doors? So. That's my vision. So, <laughs> ask me what my vision is, and then I have to go on and on. So I apologize if that went on. No, and don't on. apologize for that to happen. <laughs> thank you. So I think. Um, thank you. Um, I, I'm thinking very specifically about our board and our open board position. We don't do programs out in the community. Our job is to make regulation, health regulation, and we have are empowered by the state to do so but we're also under a lot of constraints, right? We have no budget. I mean, Meredith has budget to do certain things. Um, we also are under the open meeting law. And so we don't socialize or talk about uh, public health issues between meetings. And I, that could be really, it's, it's, I think it's hard for all of us. We feel, I mean, we've been together for a while now, these, these members, um, but it's really alienating to be on a board, come together for a meeting once a month and not really get to know each other outside um, and not socialize and not sort of have that really personal connection. And I think it's um, so having, for example, you know, a, a new person coming on the board, I would, I, you know, and I remember this when I came on the board, it's really a crazy alienating feeling. Um, that you really can't do a lot of, make a lot of personal connections. Um, so I think that's a real difficulty that um, we hey, have in our position. Can't we have a personal connection if, as long as we don't talk about public health's business? Yes. Uh, yes, but, right? I don't know what Alan would say about the, uh, is there an appearance of you know, something, although in reality, when there were five of us, two people can talk 
now that there's uh, four of us, I don't know, how, how does that work, Meredith? Do you know? That's another question for Ellen. Um, but when there were five of us, a minority of the board, we, two people could talk. Um, but we are so nervous about the open meeting law, we tend not to do that very much. So, Sarah, here's something I have for you. And, you know, we often talk about um, who we'd like to see as the fifth member of the board, but the board has no control over who that appointment is. It's the mayor who appoints our board members. Um, we'll, Will there be any type of trainings, governmental trainings that for all of our depart our committees and our boards to um, to empower them? I mean, it's. I mean, that sounds like something exactly what we would want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say that that's what we will do. I think we again, you know, once we convene and sort of come together and in a planning process, that's exactly when we would put that on the table and start to make those decisions. And this is very municipally focused. Um, and so I totally look forward to sort of digging into some of the issues that you're bringing up around, well, how does a city recruit a more diverse um, you know, group of applicants um, when the board itself can't do that, right? So like, how is that done <laughs> in a municipality um, is really, really important question. And I would think um, would be totally central to, to what we're trying to do here. And then how does that trickle down to the actual departments? You know, um, mm -hmm. how do we put out culturally sensitive information and materials? You know, I feel like we as a city as a whole really don't do a good job of that. Um, for lack of resources for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, so definitely starting from the top down, but having a domino effect onto the departmental level. Mm -hmm. uh, I, had, I had a question, which is, are you gonna look at school systems um, and specifically I, I following a little bit, the, I can give you an example. I follow the, the Cambridge system where there's about, among students, it's about uh, one third black, one third white, and <clears throat> another third other Latino and Asian and so on. But you don't see the same uh, among teachers. And that has been a, a, a big concern brought up by Cambridge teachers, which is they still, you know, essentially be sensitive to the differences. Is it is that something you you were planning to do also for uh, school systems in the county? Or? That's a really good question. Um, we haven't talked a lot about teacher representation. I'm not sure that's even what you would call it, but um, we haven't talked about that so much because we've really been focusing on governance systems. So like if we say in terms of the school, I would imagine a focus could be on the school committee um, because that's a, you know, a, a structure, a governance structure. And then also um, there's going to be a, a strong youth component to this. And so what does it look like for youth to become engaged in leadership um, and begin to, uh, become more, more involved in governance structures. I mean, it might be a school committee, but something completely different. So um, it could, and that could end up mean, meaning we have a collaboration with, um, with a school around offering some kind of leadership development program or not. Um, I think it really just depends on um, what, what comes out of our planning process. Um, I wouldn't be surprised though if representation, yeah, around teachers and then also municipal employees and, and nonprofit employees. I mean, the whole like employee part of this is kind of its own thing um, that we might end up be being able to provide resources for um, because it's gonna be a hot topic. Um, but in terms of the real focus of the grant, we're really looking at, at those governance structures. Um, on the micro level, we have um, the vacancy which is an immediate concern. Um, I, I think we can all advocate to the mayor 
if we have uh, strong feelings about about uh, selection of a board member, that doesn't mean he has to act um, in accordance with our individual perspectives, but I think that probably means a lot in this circumstance. And I want to echo what you said, Joanne. I think the idea for most people of being on a city board is incredibly intimidating. Mm -hmm. And it was intimidating for me, and I had quite a bit of experience. And I think underrepresented groups, by definition, have less experience in participating in governance like that. So there needs to be a way to support individuals in this process. And as I recall you saying, Sarah, in our conversation, there could be support for individuals themselves um, in, in their participation. I remember you said even something about transportation funding could be available for people if that's an issue at that basic level. So I think that, that there is a lot that we can um, do to help change the process of, of how the board uh, is comprised and to assure that we actually do what we say we want to do, which is encourage diversity. Um, and I think that it's, I think that we, you know, we're all professionals of a, of a certain level. We all have advanced degrees. And I think that um, we can get caught in our bubble. And I think there are times when we are surprised by our public comment periods. Thing, issues are raised, perspectives are raised that really come out of the blue for us or, or, or areas we don't have experience. Um, and if there can be some help for us in um, expanding our processes so that we're more inclusive in our whole approach to our public health board efforts, I think that would be very beneficial to us in the long run. And Joanne, uh, um, Suzanne, thanks for bringing up those points because I think another way to focus on this, Sarah, is that we have constraints, like Joanne mentioned, open meeting law. We have constraints that we, um, we are making the sausage of these policies that sometimes can be really boring and hard and difficult. And it's not that anyone from any group couldn't do the work, but it's not pretty, it's not really sexy. Um, and so somehow we have got to, you know, I had this vision, every one of us know a, a person in town that's um, a person of color and just give those names to the mayor and have them call them because a phone call from the mayor makes a difference, you know, but, but as you point out, Suzanne, once, if, if that worked and a person got here, in this board it's quite yeah it's quite intimidating and sort of like you got to get the feel of it and um and we all went through that are going through it um particularly with this item of you know we can't sort of can't pull lauren aside and say hey what do you think about this why don't we team up and do that you know but we're not allowed to do that and that's that's tough but it's real and so the more we can focus, um, or this grant can focus on the constraints of, of city government um, to help us out with that, that would be great. Mm -hmm. So thank you. We don't have that large of a minority population in the city. And yeah. I just have this feeling that people that we might think of as potential representatives have already been called by many, many organizations because the entire community awareness has raised about, about this topic. And I wouldn't want to trivialize this. Or I wouldn't want someone to say, oh, now you're interested in talking to me because, because of the public awareness. I don't want that to be what happens here. I want it to be something where it's, um, it's, it's a discussion where, where we have a process of, of trying to recruit or identify in, in a way people who might have a skill set or an interest or something that, that we may not know. Um, and to help to mentor them and coach them through 
through Sarah's organization in what it means to be um, on this board and to function in this board within the constraints we have. Everybody has constraints. Um, but that's part of governance. And so if, if, the, if the goal is to increase diversity in governance in the city, I think it takes work. Unmute, Meredith. So if, if we weren't successful in increasing diversity in, on the board with our fifth member, does this grant allow for um, your person to provide technical assistance? When we're looking to do policy on the board, um, I feel like we don't really tap in well into the um, un, underrepresented populations. How do we reach them? How do we get to the table? How could, you know? I feel like that's something that we've, that's been a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. Do you think that could be a different approach? Yeah, I mean, I think there's like the representation on a board and then there's also the engagement that happens in whatever the course of the work you're doing. And both of those places we want to work because, you know, even it, so the, the, the participation in the decision-making process isn't just you know, what happens at the board level. It's also, as you say, like when you're going to pass a policy, what kind of outreach you do in the community. And so that that's a big part of this too, is helping to bring new ideas or new methods um, to the table um, to learn together about what those can be. Um, certainly, there's maybe even methods that are already happening in Hampshire County that we just need to lift up and help people learn from each other about. Um, and so for sure, yes, I mean, it sort of talked about like, how do we help any group really um, just engage more meaningfully and more deeply and, and in an earlier stage of a process, right? Um, so that's what I hear you talking about. And, and yeah, um, you know, in terms of how much like direct technical assistance will be available, I don't know because it really comes down to kind of the staff hours, but um, I would imagine I could imagine like some really awesome trainings around community engagement for municipal boards and committees. Like I could see that as being like a series that would just make so much sense to put together um, given, you know, the level of interest from the city of Northampton. And I will say it's not just you all. I mean, it's certainly the grant, um, you know, was informed in part by the planning office um, and uh, also I've had conversations with, um, you know, various members of different boards and committees in Northampton as well. And so there's, there seems to be, I don't know if there's like widespread interest, but there's definitely, a, you know, interest from a number of different places in the city for this. Um, and then outside of Northampton, interest from the, from the other municipalities as well. So I think that'll be a big focus of this. And it's really helpful to sort of hear um, directly from you all what your constraints are um, because, you know, already I'm thinking, okay, like, so recruitment, if you want to call it that, um, of a more diverse, uh, can, you know, applica applicants really needs to have a central, it needs, to, it needs to happen from a central place because it's not going to be individual boards and committees doing that on their own obviously because of the process of the mayor, you know, appointing people. And um, it's interesting that you said, um, Cynthia, that um, you could give names to the mayor about, you know, people you think would be good, good candidates. Cause that was actually a question I had was like, to what extent is the board of health able to put forth a candidate to the mayor? Like how, how does that, how does that work? Have you done that before? Um, and yeah, I'd just be curious to know a little bit more about that. Yes, when I, when I don't I'm saying that I, uh, I meant that we as individuals can approach oh. the mayor, but I, right. I don't think that it's appropriate for us to exam for us to review candidates and go forward. Right. That's not our role, but, but as we learn about this process and um, individually or collectively start to identify people. We can we can advocate to the mayor as citizens. That's perfectly acceptable. Mm -hmm. 
And can you go and say, I have this person that I think would be really good for the Board of Health. Will you look at this application or will you will you make sure to look at their application when they uh, they submit it? I wouldn't have any problem doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he'd actually welcome it. He's pretty approachable. <laughs> so, I mean, it does seem like there's like, although you can't act as a group and you're not going to be talking about like how to recruit and find people like as individuals, you could do some um, relationship building in the community or whatever you would want. And then you can, you can actually encourage those people to apply and then put in, put in sort of a good word or something to the mayor saying, this is, this is someone I think would be really a good fit or whatever. So it sounds like there's some, there's some avenues of power there, just not a collective one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, and I, I think don't... it's interesting, like the open meeting law is about actually, it is about partly about equity. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like trying to break apart the good old boy network in a little, <laughs> you know, right? So it's like, it's funny because I feel like in some of the work, it's like, it's like come up against that, like the, everything is fair, everything is the same. And so then we can't, we can't sort of do this relational work around trying to get people we know in the community in because... It, we're sort of blocked from that. <laughs> so I think that's kind of an interesting tension. But uh, someone was going to say something. I'm muted, Joanne. Can't hear you. I'm unmuted. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, my phone and my my computer are linked. I got it. Um, so it's just saying you were talking about you want not only to, you know, to have diversity on boards, but also for people to feel comfortable in their roles. Um, and as I say, it's really difficult to feel comfortable on a board where you can't really mix socially or, you, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard. Um, it, it just makes it harder with the open meeting law to, for people to, you know, not get that personal, as much of that personal connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, could I ask what would be a next step that would be appropriate with you and your organization if we have interest in this general area? Um, the, the area of um, it, helping us with our awareness of diversity and how to operate in a more, in a, in a, in a way that's more conducive to including everyone in our community, as well as using the open position as a lever to move in that area. What, what would we do next? Um, it's a good question. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, if there's someone from this group that would like to be on the email list, I think Meredith might already be on there, but I'm not totally sure. Um, so if there's like a point of contact um, that would be appropriate for me to include so that every announcement of how we're moving through this process, you know, there's someone on the Board of Health who, know, you know, knows about it and then can tell people. And so we, we certainly hope that as we move forward, there's going to be more and more opportunities for becoming involved. Um, and as I said, the first one that we anticipate is actually um, forming um, an inclu inclusive hiring committee um, to, that's going to involve um, some members, some CES staff members and some people in the community. And they will have different roles on that committee because we have to comply with CES's policies around um, who can be involved and at what level. Um, so that's the first step. But um, beyond that, um, I'm sorry, I can't share lots of specifics about what, um, what you'll be hearing from me next, but probably the main announcement will be, hi, would you like to come to a large convening where we kick this process off? Um, so that's in terms of, you know, sort of interacting with my initiative and then if you if you had specific 
questions or specific resources that you're looking for. Um, you know, I just wrote your question down. Um, I think, you know, I could, I could certainly pull resources to that end. So you asked about how to operate in a way that's more conducive to, um, to be more inclusive, to more diverse. And when I mean diverse, I mean really not just racial and ethnic, but there's many forms of diversity that um, we're, we're thinking about in this work. So um, certainly even just someone who has a non-public health background <laughs> might be a potential, I don't know, not really sure what you're all, where you all come from, but uh, someone coming from a different sector might be considered sort of diversity within this group. You know, it might be interesting for you to explore that, like, you know, what, where are your commonalities as a group and uh, where do you think you could, um, it would be helpful to the board um, to incorporate people with different experiences or different skill sets as, as has been mentioned. Um, even just having that conversation might be an interesting one to have. Um, but I, I could pull resources if I have, um, if I, if you want to like follow up with a specific ask um, by email, I'm happy to kind of pull my colleagues who work on this work, look in my files and send you some guidance that I, that I have. Um, I don't know how much of it's going to be for municipal committees at this point though. That's like, that's capacity building for me <laughs> um, right now. So I can be as helpful as I possibly can. I'd be happy to do that. I hope that so wasn't too big, Suzanne. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're very early in your process. Yes. Um, and you're not quite sure what you're gonna, gonna be able to offer in, in yes. specifics. Um, but I'm wondering if, if we as a board wanted to have a discussion of who, of what kind of person or what um, um, assets we would be looking for for a board member, because then we could then propose that to the mayor as sort of guiding principles for who the mayor might bring on. Um, might you have someone, know of someone who could be a facilitator of that discussion for us? Hmm. Is that something you might be able to provide? Um, possibly. It's possible that I or someone in my department that's connected to this work would be able to do that. Yep. I think it would just mainly be a question of um, timing and busyness level. And then, um, you know, if we did a facilitated conversation, planning out what that looks like would probably take, take a little bit of time, maybe not too much. Um, but yeah, I can certainly consider that and I can check with my colleagues to see, do you know, like, um, what is your time frame for wanting to have that conversation? We haven't had anyone in that board position for many months. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure we're all eager to have a fifth member, but it, it hasn't been urgent. Um, there's, I don't know if there have been applications, uh, but uh, this, this sounds like something we have to cultivate ourselves. Yeah, I, I also think, I don't know if there's any applications or not, Meredith, you might know, but um, where is it advertised? <laughs> if it's the city website, forget it. Yeah. You know? So that's, that's the other piece to this. Um, how, did, how did you all hear about an opening on the board, you know? Um, and so, we have to dig deep on, on where people are getting the information that we even have an opening. So I, I have advertised it on the Northampton Facebook list and um, remember answering a couple of questions, but I seem to recall that there's an obvious perception uh, that it takes either being a physician or a um, yeah. nurse Good practitioner, point. certainly part of the medical uh, profession, or at least have a bunch of letters after your name. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. And that so that's maybe one of the concern. I'm not yeah. a physician, therefore I cannot be on the board. Or I'm not. I don't. I'm not trained in public health specifically, um, and therefore I cannot be part of this. 
Mm -hmm. So with the board, would you all be able to like influence how that vacancy gets announced? Like what if you were to come up with like a blurb about what you would like to say about serving on the board um, and what kind of skills you're looking for and some blurb that was extra welcoming and encouraging. Would that be something that you could pass to the mayor and ask that it be sent out through the communication channels? So we did that before. Um, I think when we were looking, when Cynthia and Bill, when you came on board, we were looking for someone who had um, a business background, someone who possibly owned a restaurant. Um, so we targeted our restaurant owners in Northampton. If you know they lived in Northampton, we were looking with someone with that background and we sent out the advertisement to them. So the mayor was receptive to it. That's how I got in, the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a business owner? <laughs> no. <laughs> so it ultimately wasn't successful? <laughs> well, we, did. <laughs> we got people who had compliance background. Mm -hmm. not a lot so of is, that something, is that something where uh, the folks want to discuss at the next meeting is to come up with a friendly um, job description in lay language and um, see, see where we go with that? Do you want to start there? Could we see what's been distributed to date as a starting yeah. point? Sure. Um, and, and I, Sarah, is it possible to, to send it to you just for your feedback? Um, as sure. Perhaps there's language that you're familiar with that would be helpful uh, that others have used or, or if we could um, provide that to you and then we come together next time with a, an awareness of what's been sent out with Sarah's input, that might be a good starting place. I have another question. Um, if we were to include someone whose primary language is not English? I mean, how would we function as a board? Um, can someone bring an interpreter? Or uh, Meredith, do you have any clue about how that might work? Yeah, we'd have to ask another, that. another question for Alan? Sarah, do you have thoughts about that? Any, any knowledge about how that would work? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I don't know what rules um, are in place around municipal obligations in terms of translation, if any. Um, mostly what I know is what we've done in our programs to provide translation to people. So um, it's a really, really good question. And um, one that should be part of this process, <laughs> you know, and as a question, I think that like, it's a question for the city, right? I mean, when you do public hearings, when you do outreach, um, I know there has been um, some efforts to uh, make uh, translation available or interpretation available um, if requested. Um, but what does it look like to make that more a culture of how engagement happens, right? Um, because even just requesting translation um, can feel a little bit uh, nerve wracking to people. And I love the flyers that say in English, please contact us if you need translation. Um, <laughs> you know, like, you know, we just do things like that as primary English speakers, we don't really think about, you know. So, yeah, it's a great question. Even if we're resoundingly successful in finding the perfect candidate for this open position on the board, I would, I would be interested in um, 
participating in your process as it becomes more developed so that we can function in a way that's more consistent with what you're trying to do. So I, there's the vacancy, but then there's how we operate going forward that actually makes it clear that we're serious about this. Um, so that, that would be my wish that I'm just putting that out to the others on the board. I, yeah, it got me thinking, Suzanne, what you just said that um, this is a health initiative we are the Board of Health, and it's municipal, and it's government, and we could actually take a leadership role with our city in how boards operate, how committees operate. I mean, I'm not saying we want to take that on, but I mean, it's an opportunity, um, depending on how we embrace this and, um, and all the other things on our plate. So it's an interesting way if, if uh, we, I think we all believe health is inclusive, um, with, with sociological and demographics and environment. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting way to approach our colleagues on other boards and our leadership, both on city council and in the mayor's office. So. It would be, uh, I think it would be a glaring omission if we weren't out in front. Yeah. Wouldn't be consistent with the resolution we passed. Right. All right. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for coming. It was really, uh, it's really sort of eye opening. And I know you're early in your process, but it sounds very exciting. Um, so uh, we need to sort of choose some next steps. Um, I think one thing we talked about is, um, Meredith, maybe you could uh, send around what our current job description that was put out uh, was, and maybe we can have a discussion next time about whether we, uh, well, that comes from the mayor's office, is that true? It is. I don't think there's a job description, jo Joanne. It's just a, really? of a notice of a vacancy. Mm -hmm. Huh. Well, that's really interesting. <laughs> we don't know what our job description is. <laughs> it can be whatever we need it to be at the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> um, do, you, do you have knowledge, Meredith, whether some applications have been received or you either have, don't know and none have been received? Nope. Yep. There were a few that came in uh, late spring, early summer, but I asked the mayor if we could put a hold on um, filling the position right now, just because everyone was just all too busy and to try to onboard a new board member, just no one had the bandwidth, so. I think that's fortuitous. Mm -hmm. So there's still, there. I don't need, I didn't even review who it was. I just, there was a couple letters of um, interest. Are we still at that point, Meredith? Where we you feel there's too much on your plate? You feel there's too much on your plate to move forward? There's definitely a lot on my plate, but if, you know, one of the board members can, you know, take the lead on this and Kelly being new to the, to her position, um, the transition will be difficult on the department side, but if one of the board members, the seasoned board members can help with onboarding a new board member, that would be fantastic. And we don't have the trainings happening on the state level, the introduction oh. of board members through MHOA and MH, MHB. Um, I don't know when those are going to be, you know, back on again. So I think, you know, the state as a whole, it's not their priority. So maybe that um, gives us the time to sort of talk about how we want to put this out. Um, Meredith, do you, you meet with the mayor once a week or, or on some regular basis? Do you want to uh, just run this by him and tell him that we're thinking about ways to put this out and just make sure he's receptive to that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I'll talk to him about um, perhaps putting a job description out. What does it mean to be a board member and, and work our way up yeah. from there? Mm -hmm. I'd like to know what our job description is. <laughs> Uh, any other thoughts about next and more immediate next steps? 
I just wondered if there are any job descriptions for any of the boards or committees. <laughs> um, I, in a way, I think we sort of wing it, all of collectively wing it within the purview and the, the, the regulations that we have to adhere to. Within that, it's pretty much directed by the boards and committees themselves. So Kelly found the posting. There is um, a, a quick intro about the board, but then the job description, the duties of a board member is act as a licensing authority for all public health permits and licenses, adopt, promulgate, amend, and repeal local public health regulations, hear appeals, variances, or waivers to state and local public health regulations, provide leadership to the Northampton Health Department, public health advocacy, set fees for public health permits and services. I think we could make that more inviting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Meredith, if you would send that out, um, let's uh, talk about that next time. Any other uh, next steps that anyone wants to work on? Can, can we be put, can multiple members of this call be put on your list, sir, Sarah? I mean, I Any, think, anyone can be on it. Yeah, I, I unless somebody's opposed, I, I think we could all benefit by understanding outside of this meeting the process that, that's going on with this effort so we're all informed when we come into our discussions. So, so Suzanne, do you want to be a contact for Sarah on her list and report to us when new things happen? Well, what I was just saying is that I was proposing that we all be on the list serve so that we're all mm -hmm. aware of the efforts. And, and you know, I, I'm already sort of functioning as a contact with Sarah. I'm happy to continue that. But I think rather than me being a contact and coming back reporting to the board on the developments, if we're all familiar with those as we come to the board meetings, then we, the discussion can come from that point and not just be a discussion of rehashing um, the steps that are available or the progress that is available in writing already on the listserv. But if someone doesn't want to be on the listserv, that's certainly understandable. But I thought it would be beneficial for us all to have that information ongoing. I, I don't have a problem if you want to. I mean, I can certainly either email you my give you my email address or oh, Susan, you should feel free to pass my address. If, if everyone is okay with that, maybe you can give all the addresses. Meredith, can we um, put um, redesigning power structures as a standing agenda item? And so you'd have the opportunity to discuss sort of progress or new information or Things like that um, on our agendas. Yeah. Okay. Any other ideas for next step? Good start. I, I think what what I want to make sure is hearing there are some candidates, but the recent months have been very difficult to follow up with with those new candidates it seems to me that if we're going to put some if we're going to if we are going to put something out um we need to make sure that if there are people expressing interest it gets addressed in, in a timely fashion let's say by the end of the year because i know the process is fairly long because there is first um a conversation with the mayor, followed by the conversation with someone at city council, followed by some approval. So from the moment someone gives an application, the moment that a person is actually sitting on the board, it can take a little while. I think it also the other thing is if someone applies and is interested, I'm surprised that the first thing that that person is not doing is actually attending a meeting to see what's going on. And, and if someone applies and doesn't show up and listens in, I'm just thinking, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, because the first rule of this meeting is they are open to the public, so. I, I recall someone who looked a lot like you attending a number of meetings before you. <laughs> yes. but, 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 and I was impressed when you did that, and, and I think you're right. If there's not enough interest to even attend a board meeting, then I think we need to carefully consider. Um, people won't know what they're getting into. Um, if, if they don't do that. So um, I've had one person ask me about the opening and I suggested that that person attend and that person is not. So um, no, everybody's busy. It's a crazy time. Uh, it's hard to get on Zoom meetings. Everybody's tired of Zoom meetings by the end of the day. Um, but it, it does require some familiarity with what goes on um, to, to be really serious applicant, I would think. We can include that in sort of next steps if someone shows some interest or whatever, we can sort of have a, here's a, a how, to, how to get through this process and recommendations on next steps for them. Okay, well, thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks for coming and um, you can check Connect with Meredith, I can give you our email addresses, and um, we are, we'd love to uh, keep in touch. We really appreciate your, your being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Those uh, great connections, Suzanne. I was lucky. I was lucky. <laughs> All right. Um, do we have any other, uh, any other news, anything uh, anybody wants to bring up? Oh, Meredith, you want to tell us that for a minute? Um, where you are with the uh, ambassador program? Sure, yes, we're getting to launch. Uh, our soft date is Monday. We're going to launch the program. I've hired six new public health ambassadors and we onboarded them Tuesday. Um, our vision is coming together. We're really open to suggestions and ideas. We kind of just have this. Um, draft foundation in our brain what this looks like but we're willing to adapt and grow um, so we're hoping that we get real good feedback from our ambassadors um, after a week of being out there and you know talking about what works what doesn't work perhaps bringing a trainer in and doing some role playing based off encounters that we have what are we going to measure how are we going to measure our success out there so right now, how we see it, um, we're going to be out there, boots on the ground, seven days a week. The schedule looks something like 10.30 to 6.30 in the afternoon with a little wiggle room on each end, um, basically trying to capture high use of the downtown from the public, um, high use of Pulaski Park. So um, we're going to have tables set up and it how many tables we have set up and how many people we have out there will be determined off their schedule. Um, two of our ambassadors are um, retired. They're gentlemen. One is retired from NFD. He was a deputy chief. His name is David Gagney. And then who also works with uh, ServiceNet currently, who also worked in our um, shelter over the winter. So he is very, very familiar with the houseless population and has trusted relationships with them. So he's gonna kind of be our anchor in Pulaski Park with our table that's out there. Um, and then the other gentleman's name is Mike Denno. He too worked for the um, fire department very early in his career. Then he worked for, um, uh, who do you work for? Not the DA's office, I, I, the sheriff's department. And then he spent his last uh, couple decades at Coca-Cola um, and he's since retired from there. Um, he too is going to kind of be an anchor of the program. Um, and then we have four of our ambassadors are college students, one from Smith, three from UMass. Um, two of them speak multi-languages, which is fantastic. Um, ben O'Connor is my full-time uh, COVID compliance officer, and he's kind of supervising the staff and spearheading this project. So with that being said, seven days a week, um, as many people out there as we can, it's our intention if we have 
three people on shift at one time to have three tables out, one at each entrance of Pulaski Park and then the other at the bus station near Urban Outfitters. If we have a fourth person on shift, there'll be a, flo a floater. At our tables, we'll be equipped with brochures um, based, and they're all, uh, the majority of the information is COVID related. Um, we're gonna have other information out there too, Narcan available, because um, they are public health ambassadors, not just COVID ambassadors. We're going to have maps of the um, mandatory mask zones. We also have QR codes that are on our, are going to be on our signs. So you can just take a picture of it and the, the zone will come up. We're gonna put QR codes maybe on the pathways, um, on the sidewalks downtown. So anyways, um, so that's gonna be our placement of our ambassadors. It's more about people coming to us looking for information than us going up to them and telling them information. We tried that with Ben early on. It really was not received well by, um, by the general public. Um, it, we, got, we were told it looked like we were targeting cer certain populations. So that's when we kind of took a step back and are changing our approach. Um, Pulaski Park come Monday is gonna be a mask break zone in the green space area and on the cobblestone area. So in the green space area, we're gonna have giant circles um, at least six feet apart from one another where you and your social pod can go and sit and um, take your mask off. You have to wear your mask to get there, but once you're inside of your, your circle, you can take your mask off. This is important, I found, because a lot of our people that work in the downtown businesses eight hours a day don't have any type of reprieve from taking their mask off. Um, if they have a 15 minute break or go to get something to eat and take it out and wanna eat it somewhere, because right now everywhere in the downtown business district, you have to wear a mask. And also I think it will help with the populations that utilize the parks and do sit in their social pods and don't wear their masks. So now if there's an actual place to do that safely and the other people who are utilizing the park to feel safe, that those who aren't wearing masks are socially separated from you know, just the general pop, uh, public, I think it might, it, might, it might naturally happen that way organically, I'm hoping. Um, I could be optimistic, but that is my vision. I think with having the mask break zone, we'll also see better compliance in downtown. I think we have fairly good compliance in downtown already. I'm out there quite a bit. And just, you know, anecdotally, um, what I'm observing is really relatively good compliance. I wanna say anywhere from 95% and higher. I rarely see someone without a mask unless it's Pulaski Park, City Hall Sears or Edwards Church. Those are the three main areas that I see people without masks and congregating. Um, but otherwise, just the general mill people walking up and down the streets, it's, it's relatively um, good compliance. But we'll be capturing that. Um, we're, our, our public health ambassadors will have clickers. Um, they'll be capturing data, how many people are wearing masks, how many people aren't wearing masks. Um, how many encounters they have, um, what type of information they're giving out. Um, I'm open to any ideas that you have. Thorns Market, um, Jody Doyle from Thorns Market has graciously given all, uh, keys to all of my ambassadors so they can use the restrooms downtown um, in Thorns Market when we're not open in City Hall. Um, we're gonna store our stuff in, in um, the parking garage. And I'm hoping to get the businesses involved too in some way or another. I see Amy Kayleen on um, the Zoom call, which is great because I've been meaning to talk to her. So at least now she's kind of getting, getting an abbreviation of what this program is all about. But again, our biggest goal for the project is to increase mass compliance in the downtown area. And eventually phase two, we're gonna go up to the Florence area. Sounds great. I think it's very exciting. I'd love to hear how it how it goes. Yeah. Comments, comments or questions? Susie. Um, 
Mondays. Monday's going to start, you say? Yeah. 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 And Just they're going to be uh, identified in some way? Yep, yeah, they have shirts. We're ordering them uh, insulated windbreakers, hats, beanies, and they'll have a city ID tag. Meredith, um, this is great. And you mentioned something that I put in the back of my head, but I know it's probably in the forward of yours, the shelter. Yeah. Are you thinking about that as the weather turns? I certainly am. Um, um, yes, Wednesday's call, I brought it up to the emergency management team that we need to get a subcommittee together to start talking about what the shelter looks like for this season. Um, so yeah, we are definitely thinking about it. Uh, I can't believe how fast this has happened. I feel like we just closed it. Um, yeah. um, and there's been everyone that I know from ServiceNet is no longer there. So wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. So. And the venue wouldn't be available, or is it? What's going on in the school, uh, high school? So right now, the um, daycare providers are doing, um, have been given permission by the school committee to do, in essence, it's child care, but with remote learning from the teachers in the classroom. So there are students in all of our schools right now. Yes, okay. Mm-hmm. So I don't think we'll have that option. Yeah. We're looking at the senior center because I don't think the senior center will be open anytime soon, but we want to make sure part of our um, plans are, are we want to make sure that whatever facility we choose for a shelter meets the American Red Cross criteria. They set the standards and we've always followed by that. Mm -hmm. But thank you for Any me. other thoughts, questions? Meredith, do you have anything else you wanted to report on? Not necessarily, unless you're looking for something specific. We did, um, I uploaded a graph onto our website, it's the COVID website, um, that gives you Northampton specific data. So we'll be updating that every single week if you guys want to look at that, totally up to you. Um, it kind of breaks down that you know, the stoplight um, color-coded map um, a little bit. So if you were to see that we were in red because we had 14 cases, you'd be able to see um, how many were in a long-term health care healthcare facility or cluster case versus community. Mm -hmm. So we're making that information available to the public. Uh, I do have a staff update too. Um, Amy Hutchins was hired and started on Monday. She's our new health inspector. Super excited to have her. Um, she's native to Northampton. She was the Hatfield Food Service Director prior to coming to us. Um, so she does have some experience in um, state sanitary codes and application thereof. And um, just being a native to Northampton, just being familiar with the culture and the community will be extremely helpful. And then um, Vivian Franklin is, has also been hired. I think she's been working with us for about six, you know, maybe a month, I don't know, time flies. Um, she is our second public health nurse full time. She has been hired primarily, her focus is COVID related contact tracing, um, help navigate through, you know, all of the orders um, with a health lens. Um, she's fantastic. And then, Additionally, uh, sad news, uh, Jenny Meyer gave her resignation. Jenny Meyer is our full-time public health nurse. She um, is leaving to move to Vermont. Um, she's pretty burnt out, um, as many public health professionals are. And um, her last official day in the office is the 25th, but she has agreed to stay on remotely um, to provide TA to me and to help with the transition of when I hire a new public health nurse. So I had a staff meeting this morning and you guys would be extremely impressed because I sat in awe with my jaw on my desk for about a minute. There was 18 of us in our staff meeting this morning. Oh my, how we've grown from three of us when I started nine years ago. <laughs> You've done an amazing job. 
so amazing, amazing. It was just, it was really kind of like, wow. Yeah, it took up a, our whole screen. <laughs> so, it's, uh, so I'm very sad to lose Jenny. Um, she has been great. She brought in uh, a vision and different skills to our prior public health nurse, but hopefully we'll be able to carry that on and grow even further um, in that division. But she's been a wonderful, wonderful asset. She did a great yeah, job. Please, yeah, please tell her she'll be missed by us as well. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. And Meredith, I want to congratulate you on your continued hard work um, during ve ve very difficult times for everyone, but I think you carry a special burden. And thank you for doing that for all of us. Oh, thank you, Suzanne. I, I do appreciate that. I know you do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And yay, Meredith had some time away last week, right? Awesome. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Anybody have anything else they want to bring up? Um, uh, anything else? Amy. Oh, okay. Amy. Yep. She typed in in the chat. It sounds wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. If we could talk offline, if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear about them. <laughs> totally. Thank you. All right. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. So, Cynthia, you're giving a second? I a second, time? sorry. <laughs> did we open Any... it? Yes, we did. Did you officially open it? Okay. Um, um, any discussion? All in favor? Roll call. Um, uh, Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. And Joanne, yes. Thank you all.